piece, but there wasn't different oils. Everything used uh, mineral oil. Well, mineral oil doesn't do well with some of the refrigerants. And if it doesn't do well with the, with the refrigerants, that's a problem because it doesn't get returned back to the compressor where it needs to be. The, the uh, problem that you run into is they have what's called, or some will have what's called reverse solubility. And the, the bottom line is the refrigerant will get hung in places like the condenser or, or in the bottom of the uh, receiver. And if it's not in the compressor, it's not doing any good. In fact, it's doing harm in those places. It was, <clears throat> with the mineral oils, we always had to worry about the refrigerants getting hung in the, I mean, not refrigerants, but the oils getting hung in the evaporator. Now, in the evaporator, we took precautions to figure out how and pipe it properly so that the oil would find a way to return back to the compressor. But when you start dealing with some of the blends or, or the other refrigerants, then you have to look at it with a whole new light. Just to kind of give you an idea of some of the oils that's out there, we still have the mineral oil, we have a polyalkaline glycol, a polyester, and there's one more al uh, alkali benzene. And I'm sure I really tore those pronunciations up <laughs> bad. Okay? But the bottom line is you need to know what kind of oil that particular system has in it before you start adding oil. But you also need to know why you're adding oil. And I want to say a little more about that because a refrigerant system should never have to have oil added to it. Yes? How, um, like on a refrigerant, would it tell you what type of oil it carries? No, but the machine should. Now, the older machines don't have that. But the newer machines usually have the type of oil somewhere on the nameplate or on the compressor. So how would you go about finding it like an older machine? Okay, the older machine, what I would do is get the model number and the uh, even the compressor number and call the, uh, someone that can look it up on, uh, from the manufacturer. Okay, it's uh, you don't want to mix oils. Okay, because sometimes it's like water and oil; they just don't go together all that well, and you can actually cause damage within the system too. So, it's a good question, and to be quite honest with you, it's been one that. I've asked, I've had uh, that asked to me several times, and I really don't know a sure way other than getting the model and, and going back to the manufacturer and finding out what they use there if it's not stamped somewhere. Okay. Uh, but the question that I just proposed is when do you need to add oil? Well, some systems will have a site glass, oil site glass, and just because that site glass indicates that it's low doesn't mean that it, you need to add oil. You can actually get in a situation of having too much oil in the system. Now, of course, if you've got one that's sprung a leak somewhere, like on the bottom of the oil pan or something like that, and all the oil's gone, there's no question about where the oil went. That, that would be understandable to add oil back to it. But if you have one and it shows no leaks or anything anywhere, that oil is trapped in that system somewhere. You need to find out where that oil is trapped and especially if you have a refrigeration, if it hadn't gone into a defrost properly, then it could be in the evaporator. And if you add oil back to that system, and then that oil comes back to the compressor, then you have a problem with too much oil. The oil in the sight glass, the oil sight glass, should be somewhere between a third and two thirds on the scale. In other words, halfway would be perfect. But I'm, I, you know, it's not a perfect world. <laughs> okay. So much for that about oils. Let's go to our cylinders. There's a couple of kind of cylinders out there. Now, now first of all, the refrigerants are color coded. Now, I will say this about the color coding on the uh, on the uh, refrigerant cylinders. Let's take the color blue for example. How many shades of blue are there? Okay. Several. <laughs> <laughs> Well, always look on the cylinder itself and see what it is. Don't go by the color alone. I, there's a couple of cylinders here. I, I could use them as an example. They're both called blue, but it's one of them looks almost green to me. 
And, you know, that may be a little color blindness on my behalf, but just the same, it's always better to take a look at the, the what is on the cylinder itself. Okay, but the, you can go by the color codes to a certain extent, but don't depend on, on the color codes entirely. Now, basically there's two types of cylinders. There's a non-refillable uh, refrigerant cylinder, and then there is a serviceable cylinder. The service, serviceable cylinder will uh, actually be gray with a yellow top. That is the standard colors for it. Now, there's some uh, information on the cylinder markings that you need to become aware of. That is the uh, water capacity. That's the way that you measure how much volumes that that cylinder actually has in it. The tear weight, that is the weight of the cylinder, date of manufacture. These, these cylinders have to be tested. They have to be tested on a, on a uh, schedule. And you want to know what that first retest date is and when the last time it was uh, tested. And some cylinders, well, cylinders do have a, a, a last allowable retest date also, okay? Understanding those markings is something that you will be going through in one of the labs, and uh, I think you'll have a better understanding of that after that. Do not overcharge the cylinders. A cylinder should never be filled more than 80% of its capacity. Okay, you get past that point, it doesn't allow for the uh, expansion of the refrigerant, and you could actually have the cylinder to pop off and release the refrigerant through the safety valve, hopefully, or Worst case scenario, explode. And I don't think anybody wants to be around for that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that sounds kind of dangerous. You're right. Uh, by the way, non-refillable cylinders mean just that. It is against the law to refill a a. Uh, cylinder, non, a non-refillable cylinder. Federal law is pretty serious about that. In fact, it forbids transportation if re refilled and how about a $500,000 fine and five years in prison for doing so? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you refill a non-refillable cylinder. Now, a lot of them have check valves built into them nowadays. Uh, Y'all remember the it used to be a very common thing to see a little kit to make a refrigerant cylinder into an air tank. That's against the law. Okay? These tanks are very thin and they're metal, and uh, air has moisture in it, and if this tank were sitting around for a while, that moisture would actually rust out the bottom of the tank and could actually make a weak point that could explode. And I often wondered, well, hey, you know what that little kit was about? 15 bucks, but yet you could buy a cylinder made for that, a, a, a uh, we always call them a little pig, air pig, uh, for 20, 25 bucks. So, and it had the gauges and everything already on it. So, you know, I don't know. I never quite understood why it was such a good deal to make a, a uh, air tank out of a refrigerant cylinder, but don't do that. That's against the law. That should conclude our our lecture on refrigerant and oil identification today. I, I appreciate you uh, bearing with me through this. I know my pronunciations are terrible, but that's just me, and uh, we'll just have to go with it. With that.